works that uh, give a flavour of, of what we've been do what I've been doing. But I've probably steered away from that and, and gone a bit wider. But hopefully, it will it will lead to a, to a bit of a uh, an open discussion depending on people's interests. Um, so generally, I'm trying to give a, a human centric overview to the future mobility. I think this topic is one which uh, tends to get a lot of excitement about the technology and sometimes loses sight of the, the problem or the problem statement which we're trying to solve. So that's the lens that I'll be talking through today. Um, as, as Daniel, I think he gave a, a great summary and I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding any sales pitch, but WSP is uh, you know, one of the, the largest professional services engineering firms. Uh, globally, we're about 50,000. So um, the discussion about uh, acquisitions and things is, is, is very commonplace as, as the, the, the beast continues to grow. Um, but as a kind of overview, yes, we, we do many things across the civil engineering built environment. So um, anything from uh, the, the recent 2050 industrial decarbonisation roadmaps uh, for the government through to the, the built environment. So London Bridge Station redevelopment and the Shard, we, we did a lot of the, the structural engineering and planning and design, design, design for that. Um, this is me, if you haven't met me. I've uh, been at a few other CUSP, CUSP meetings, but uh, uh, this was, I think, a, a excitable moment in front of one of the UK's autonomous vehicles out in Copenhagen, the ITS World Congress. Um, my background's in geography, transport planning. Um, I've worked for Arup, I've worked in London, Hong Kong, and in projects across the world. And then the last six, seven years have been at WSP and been focusing on future mobility uh, and obviously very happy to be part of the CUSP network uh, this year. So uh, what is future mobility? Uh, a very dramatic quote I'll start with, but I quite like it because it's it, it brings a lot of uh, thinking to a concise statement. The, the future's already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And I think, uh, with what I'll talk to on what's happened and what COVID 19s brought, that um, we really see that now that the certain use cases become accelerated and happen because the conditions for success enable them to do so. Um, I'll also send a link to our recent brochure, which I think uh, is, is a concise summary of what I'm talking to. So uh, we're very much uh, focused on decarbonisation as a as a general principle. Um, and then the, the, the imagery, the, the themes are very much around, it's more than test technology, it's about people and places. Um, and so the, um, the design thinking type approach, so the, the, the famous sort of double diamond is its core to everything that we do, but also the, the six key changes that the government um, has kind of identified are, are our broad remit. Of, of technical expertise, so anything around automation, cleaner transport, new business models, new modes, data and connectivity, and, and changing attitudes. Um, some of the types of clients that we'll do work for are the uh, national level government uh, and, and regional and, and local, so uh, the likes of uh, Transport for Southeast, writing their future mobility policy, uh, some of the other combined authorities, and then I have a bit more of a remit on the um, on the private sector, so uh, uh, sort of large retail asset owners, um, transport operators, um, property developers, master planners, etc. Uh, so at a, at a very high level, um, we do a lot of the front end of the comment around the planning and advice for future mobility and therefore um, we truly try to take this people-centric approach, so always segmenting um, uh, around the young, the aging, the socially excluded, the less abled, and then segmenting within society and, and what their needs might be for mobility. Um, combining that uh, particularly around the different activities that people are accessing. So what are people's different mobility needs if they are accessing retail or healthcare or workplace, etc. Uh, and including that when it's also, you know, mobility for us also includes a digital as a mode so when you're not making the journey but you're deciding to as we are all now um, uh, accessing uh, opportunities through digital as a means so 
the place led thinking is also uh, key because the applicability of these things changes for different areas. So we always consider different needs for rural, peri-urban or urban. And then some some nice community outcomes that we that will capture. So we want friendlier, greener, happier, healthier, more productive, more prosperous. And more recently, I think we've probably all been a bit more sensitive to how pleasant and quiet uh, places can be. Um, so this is our fairly messy but integrated way of uh, thinking about future mobility. It's, uh, it's first, it's about people, place and activity, and then it's thinking about the wider um, integration alongside energy and digital and access across all modes. This is the uh, Department for Transport's um, Future of Mobility Urban Strategy, so it's probably the best uh, document to read if you're wanting to understand a, a holistic definition of future mobility, the six key changes I mentioned, uh, but it's centred in outcomes and opportunities, so it's about improving productivity, it's about safer streets, it's about a more inclusive transport system. The policy and strategy landscape in the UK is, uh, is you know, extremely strong when you compare it with uh, our other international comparisons. Um, and, you know, the future mobility is, is one of the grand challenges alongside uh, a, uh, artificial intelligence and data, ageing society and clean growth. There's been a number of um, uh, policy documentation in the last few years. So road to zero around electrification, considerations for the national grid, um, DEFRA's clean air strategy, and then uh, we've seen the future mobility urban strategy, and this year um, there's a future mobility regulatory review, and we might also expect to see a more rural uh, mobility strategy. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this uh, uh, message, this, this imagery around uh, the show your stripes data. Uh, my colleague Charles Perkins, who, who jointly leads our team, usually presents this and says, uh, uh, leave the room now. The data is irrefutable if you disagree. So um, feel free to sign off now if you're in disagreement. Um, the, from a transport perspective and under the cleaner transport theme, uh, what's this the data for the licensed plug-in cars and, and vans in, the, in England over the last sort of eight years? So what's interesting uh, for me is the, um, you know, the, the uptake in different areas. And this is not just driven by the availability of charging infrastructure it's also wider conditions for success um, affordability um, you know enabling local authority the, the um, commercial viability for fleets and, and utilization um, those other things so while our Nissan Leafs are being produced in the northeast um, you know that they're, they're not the ones that are adopting uh, electric vehicles uh, the SMMT data is something our, our team keeps a close eye on. So the uh, the um, data for February, so this is before COVID-19 impacts, um, electric vehicles continue to be uh, very, very strong. Um, still a small market share overall of new vehicles, but percentage change is significant. Um, there's also, I think, uh, an important point around the, the mild um, hybrid or the self-charging which are still dirty in in some respect that they are still having you know fuel pumped into them so um, it's it's important to understand what what these different vehicles actually are um, and of course petrol and diesel uh, continues to decline the more scary uh, data on um, from smmt for from April and this year is the clearly the, the impacts of COVID-19 being being realised. So um, the UK automotive market in, in a bit of trouble. Um, but the electrification, as I mentioned, is, is, is coming in, in fleets and, and particularly uh, through local authorities uh, accelerating the, uh, the deployment of electric vehicles. So this is a electric van uh, snapped in Southampton, but um, we also been talking to Nottingham and they're probably Nottingham City Council, one of the leaders in electrification of fleets, so much that they've developed their own. Oh, just double on me. Um, they've got their own electric vehicle depot where they're now providing services for um, uh, the, the general public on uh, maintenance of EV fleets, and they've got their electric refuse vehicles uh, turning up shortly. Um, 
this is a seventy thousand pound EV taxi, rapid charging across London, and uh, what what fits with our narrative and understanding the uptake of these types of things is recognizing the needs of the driver and the positioning of charging infrastructure next to what is a traditional established resting area for drivers so the driver can go and have his bacon butty while his vehicle's charging in a convenient location and, and those more subtle elements of thinking about where charging infrastructure is placed are absolutely key to understanding uptake and convenience it's the arrival van um, so a very swish um, specifically designed uh, ev um, van uh, which uh, being tested with with Royal Mail uh, soon, but also uh, UPS. You may have seen have ordered ten thousand units of this. So arrival have got a got a new warehouse being set up in in um, in, in the Wembley Industrial Estate. Um, very positive thing to see. Uh, obviously, electrification or EVs aren't the solution for 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 all types of vehicles. So hydrogen fuel cell buses uh, being trialled in Aberdeen and uh, and in Liverpool and London, and for that use case, it's very much about HGVs and um, and large buses uh, and diff very different considerations around uh, where hydrogen is produced and how it's transported. Um, I'm going to be very quick through the data and connectivity pieces given some of the experts on, on the call but um, related to mobility it's around the connectivity of the individual and, and their potential access to different forms of mobility so uh, what's relevant there is clearly the um, level of connectivity and, and mobile broadband and uh, uh, that's that's increasing as well as the different number of devices we are now um, connected to so the emergence of wearables and Alexa in your home the likes of virgin trains were in, a, in an earlier time you know giving apps for visually impaired people to uh, to book their, their train journey through their um, uh, Alexa uh, at home and for uh, connected vehicles uh, this is uh, you know very near reality that uh, by the mid 2020s all new vehicles sold will be connected vehicles so that does um, uh, provide significant potential for um, efficiency of managing traffic and how vehicles uh, communicate information to the driver and to one another um, and for uh, for the potential for 5g um, so Clearly, lots of stories about 5G and some scary misunderstandings, but it's not just about uh, Kevin Bacon saying we can watch cat videos at higher speeds. It's about the zero latency, things happening in real time, uh, and using digital comms in a in a different way for um, virtual operators, for corporate networks, for smart manufacturing. Um, but we need to recognise it. You know, the infrastructure for providing this. Um, could be slower than uh, we're used to for 3G and 4G to, to roll out. Some of the new business models, um, so if you haven't had a go in Hamburg on, on Moya, it's, it's probably the slickest uh, new uh, sort of shared mobility experience I think you could have. Um, so this is their leather seated um, Wi-Fi equipped cup holder and USB charging um, and uh, really does provide a real alternative to car uh, car ownership. So there's some, I think, uh, in, in excess of 30% mode shift to from private car to this type of service, and it's very affordable. So um, there's variations of this emerging in the UK, uh, the likes of Reva Click, uh, Zelo, and um, Via Van. And, uh, we're doing a lot of work on these types of demand responsive services. The business models, I think, are also extending into rural. So in uh, in Spain, as well, across the UK, as you know, the rural communities are experiencing the pain points of limited access to uh, key key services. Um, but interesting that while the majority of the focus has been on urban, that they're starting to see uh, potential um, business models for fractional ownership and car sharing in in rural communities. Um, for new modes, uh, Starship, Droids, uh, uh, very uh, popular hero, I guess, under the COVID-19 um, uh, crisis. Uh, so they've significantly increased their fleet and the number of deliveries they've served to different people. Um, but again, it's about the applicability. So these 
roaring success at Milton Keynes with great user feedback but when trialled in uh, in London and on a, on a more restrictive uh, street widths and, and things like that that uh, you, you you get people just flipping them over for fun so it, it's very much about the applicability in the business case that leads to the success of some of these things. Um, E-scooters, uh, so these are some of the things that will be tested in the future transport zones in the UK um, and currently illegal in the UK, both on pavement and on uh, on the highway, on the carriageway. Um, I mean, I've I've actually purchased one myself, but I'm, I'm hoping that with what's happening, this, that they'll accelerate the legislative review of, of these because they really do uh, have potential to improve um, sort of accessibility and provide alternatives to um, private car. Um, another new mode that's got a lot of potential, so this is Magway, which is the um, uh, magnetic supporting uh, uh, pipeline logistics unit. So uh, they have the potential to um, uh, transport the equivalent of one articulated lorry's worth of of, of goods every every minute so uh, under a, a sort of fixed network it could be significant uh, payloads and um, very um, energy efficient in, in how that's done as well so we're looking at uh, sort of or these guys are looking at airports and new master plans where this can be designed from the off and really uh, remove vehicle movements from uh, street level that you know conflict with pedestrians things like that drones also um seeing a uh, a bit more popularity uh, in, in the, the covid19 response um so you may have seen the uh, portsmouth solent uh, use case for which uh, drones are being planned to send um, medical supplies uh, uh to the nhs trust in, the, in that location um and we're doing a similar study elsewhere in the UK for, for drones use for medical supplies. Uh, automation, uh, the reason this has come towards the end of the, the six key changes is because despite the excitement, I think the, the widespread deployment uh, of autonomous vehicles, uh, the level four, which is the real level of automation, which really changes things and changes uh, accessibility and, and and how streets are designed and things like that only starts to emerge as a proportion of new registrations in in the mid 2024-25 so uh, while some of those vehicles will be deployed in uh, in fleets and will get a high utilization they still make up a very small proportion of uh, what we expect on our roads in the next uh, five to ten years um, but they are being tested so um, supervisors behind the wheels for 5ai are testing them on roads uh, in london uh, at the moment and then we've got automated shuttles, which are uh, clearly uh, improving familiarity with people to, to automated technology, but they're essentially following a breadcrumb trail of GPS uh, in, a, in a controlled environment. Um, uh, and the automotive, uh, so are bringing very different concepts through to what those autonomous vehicles might look like in the future and the different use cases they might support. So we have projects which are looking at um, how the vehicles could uh, provide a sort of retail pop-up uh, unit in, in one location and then at different times of the day uh, be repurposed to provide passenger transport or uh, move goods around in a different way. Um, so that uh, utilization of the vehicle and the uh, unit economics suddenly opens it up to different deployments, uh, improving accessibility. For the last uh, mile or the last metre for freight, so um, this I think was a bit more of a concept, but uh, Agility Robotics and others have um, you know, developed robots that are very uh, functional and they're looking to automate that last part of the journey, um, whether by drone or directly into your fridge, which I know uh, Picardo are looking at. Um, and then the final of the six key changes that we've covered here is around changing attitudes. So, um, this is looking forward to 2038, the ONS data, and thinking about people's needs for mobility. Under 16s, I think, is not uh, too uh, uh, scary or change to today in terms of uh, being around 20% of the population. But then looking at the, um, the uh, over 65s, 
in 2038. So the dark blue being 20 or 30 to 40 percent, you can start to see how extensive that becomes and, and what that means for their mobility needs as well. Uh, so that segmentation of uh, different people and their needs is uh, is key to, to how we work. So the strategic studies that we do. So this is some um, uh, analysis work we've done for England's Economic Heartland. We will do a lot of work based on the Experian Mosaic data set, which um, segments the UK population by 65 or 66 different socioeconomic types. And what we can do there is build our, our learnings on on all those different profiles to understand how might a different type of user um, uh, travel today and how might they be receptive to different future technologies whether mobility as a service or um, autonomous vehicles or e-scooters and, and the like. And so what that's leading to is how we embed that in place and, and design for a new uh, integration of uh, transport modes in the places that people interchange at and move through. So mobility hubs as a concept are, are evolving from just being the aggregation of uh, transport modes to being um, much wider to thinking about the needs of people moving through places and, and what their needs might be. So if you, some work we did in West Yorkshire. If you think about the needs of the people moving through the high street and uh, what might be the demand for um, facilities such as creche, medical hub, cafe, co working, overall you can start to reduce um, travel demand uh, in the region because you're you're making these services more convenient and reducing uh, further link trips. Um, we developed a concept around a, a sort of simple parking bay unit as a as a proxy measure that you can then measure all these things against in terms of cost and benefit and spatial allocation. So the other bit I wanted to cover was the UK's uh, future transport zones. Um, so these are probably where the attention should be in the real world in the UK as to um, where innovation will, will be delivered at scale. So um, Grant Chaps, the Secretary of State for Transport, we're on the cusp of a transport revolution. Emerging technologies are ripping up the rule book and changing the way people and goods move forever. Um, what does that actually mean? Well, there's 90 million pounds funding that's been awarded to Transport for West Midlands, to Portsmouth and Southampton, uh, West of England and Derby and Nottingham. And the focus of, uh, I mean, all of their submissions are available online, so you can read them in detail, but they're testing how legislation could be uh, improved, how we can focus on outcomes through the deployment of things like mobility credits, mobility as a service, drone deliveries, e-scooters, and mobility hubs. So they're creating the, um, the enabling conditions for testing these things and measuring the impacts on people. So you may have seen, things such as Coventry with the um, mobility credits, so giving uh, individuals an incentive of £3,000 a year to give up their cars. Um, likewise, I mentioned earlier the, the immediate um, response, uh, which was already proposed in uh, Portsmouth Southampton's uh, future transport zone to um, use drones to deliver supplies to the Isle of Wight. Some work we did for Transport West Midlands on their future transport zone um, very much adopted this needs and pain points approach for uh, engaging with uh, staff that commuted to a large employer and really uh, defining them in detail. Um, what were the drivers for um, how they chose uh, different mobility on, uh, on their commute and how could we craft a uh, technology experience innovation that um, encouraged them to shift from private car so there's a lot of GIS analysis around where those people sat and how we might be able to craft a few uh, demand responsive ride hailing ride sharing car sharing uh, interventions that might also be supplemented by some uh, softer rewards around uh, vouchers for food, uh, cinema vouchers, things that um, might motivate these people to uh, to really shift from using their car. Um, a similar approach where we're, we're working with Solihull um, 
to take this use case led approach. So um, we're looking at low carbon interventions in the region and we very much started uh, by identifying the the uh, the worst performers, I guess, from a use case perspective. So thinking about um, consumer delivery, uh, thinking about Amazon Prime type deliveries, how do we identify in the region where the um, the best, the biggest impact might be for targeting certain interventions? Uh, similarly, for staff commuting, uh, residential trips, how do we reduce single car occupancy trips? And then other use cases around school drop-off, um, improving access for the socially excluded and then improving non-emergency uh, patient travel so there's a lot of um, uh, GIS analysis uh, segmentation of people's needs and then um, ideation design thinking to come up with potential solutions um, the type of work we do for private sector uh, there's lots of different things but I thought these might be interesting so electric vehicle infrastructure unsurprisingly um, master planning for low carbon communities and then some future ready um, future proofing for different assets so for electric vehicles uh, we do a lot for forecasting the demand for electric vehicles in a particular location um, that can be a consideration of the both the demand and the supply side so who are the people both from a uh, individual perspective but also a fleet um, demand perspective in a region that um, will Will potentially be uh, needing to charge at a particular location. What are the different vehicle types they use and and uh, and charging infrastructure that you might need to put in? Um, likewise, we do work for the electrification of bus fleets globally. So we have a very advanced tool uh, called the Bolt tool that um, looks at the performance of different um, uh, battery uh, within vehicles and considers how that battery might perform for a particular route that that vehicle will run so considering the vehicle sorry the route topography that it might do how the ridership will change along that route so the weight on the vehicle and the weather conditions and that will give us the um, both the routing that you might want to do as well as where do you put the charging along that route to support that service um, the the other piece around designing for low carbon communities so this is uh, quite different but it relates to master planning and uh, planning for new developments uh, you might recognize a fairly traditional approach for uh, doing transport assessments for new development has been always around predicting and providing so looking at surveys for similar sites over the last 10 years and applying them but to a different location which then leads to a um, uh, just simply designing mitigation to accommodate what might happen and then walking away from the scheme. What is being, I guess, thrust into a number of schemes now is a more of a vision and validate approach, which um, is a lot more user centric and agile in how it's deployed. So uh, that segmentation I talked around of who are the people that might live here and what are their needs? How do you plan the services to meet all of their journey purposes? And then how do you deploy something that's iterative and can be refined as, as things go on? So there are some interesting discussions around the data monitoring side of that to capture user behavior and service iteration. Um, the last point was around future ready assets. So we're doing a lot for um, large uh, retail um, asset owners, uh, shopping centers, um, high speed rail and, and similar for um, how do you design a scheme today where the parking could be uh, adapted for uh, different uses in the future, given the uptake of shared mobility and autonomous vehicles, but also how do you design for a significant um, uplift in uh, pick up and drop off capacity? So we're, we're working through a number of designs uh, on that. The final piece, which uh, I don't have the answer to, but was more of a hopefully lead into a discussion was what does uh, COVID-19 mean for future mobility? Um, so we've actually done a number of sprints uh, within our within our internal teams and also for certain clients where we're, we're adopting this approach of looking at the macro trends of what's happening. So what does COVID-19 mean for mobility and, and travel demand? Um, looking at the timeline of impacts in the short, medium and long term for business society and and in how we uh, can provide solutions to that um, 
then doing a targeted ideation. So the six key changes that I've talked around, how are those uh, changing? So um, automation becoming maybe more important for drones and uh, remote deliveries, things like that. And then doing a, uh, persona problem solving so certainly we've looked at how uh, socially excluded and the elderly you know need to have access to essential goods and, and that's a key uh, f future use case for for drone deployment that we're looking at uh, and finally that that leads to some very practical actions that we can take away or, or our clients can take away so we've um, been using this to a lot of success into how we consider uh, in a very holistic way what the impacts of COVID-19 might be uh, and how things might change. Um, I think that's my uh, bold statement to finish with. So let's change the way we think. Let's create change is, is how we uh, are pushing future mobility. And uh, I'm not sure how I did on timing, but I hope that's left enough time for some questions. Um, and happy to talk in more detail about specific projects. Thank you, thank you, Toby. The timing is great. So I would ask uh, Eugene to just uh, stop the recording.